Friends, we are right now looking at the makot. Finally, the plagues are coming upon Mitzrayim, upon the Egyptians, to uh, give them a lesson. And really, the makot, the plagues, came as a lesson to the Jewish people, uh, to the Mitzrayim, but also the Jewish people. Every single one of the makot was designed. Most of them had three weeks of warning and one week of plague. Not all of them, but most of them did. That means the entire process of the 10 plagues took many, many months. This was a university that all of Mitzrayim went through to learn about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's a fascinating Midrash I must share with you of Moshe Rabbeinu walking in to see Paro. And they had a conversation. The Midrash tells us. Moshe Rabbeinu walks over to Paro and says, I am here to represent HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You've got to let my people go. Well, you've all seen the movie. The book is better. And Paro says, well, who exactly are you representing? Which God? And he says, the one, the true God, the creator of Shemayim Va'aretz, heavens and earth. He says, well, what's his name? He says, his name is Yud, with a hey and a vav and a hey. And Paro says, I've never heard of him. And he calls one of his sons or one of his servants and says, bring me the book of gods, small g. And according to the Midrash, his son or his servant came out with a thick book full of all the gods of its rhyme. They had so many gods, so many. They had gods for the rain, they had gods for the sea, they had the Nile god, they had the fish god Dagon, they had the sun god Ra, you name it. They had a God for it. And every single one of these gods was listed in this book. And the Midrash says that Paro went through this entire book and said, I went through and I looked and your God that you're talking about is not here. Therefore, I'm not interested. And that is how the Midrash ends. And the Chachamim are very puzzled by this. And they're like, well, what's the big deal? Why can't he just take this book Take out a pen and say, okay, what's the name of your God? Yud with a hey and a vav and a hey, which we'll talk about in a second. Fantastic. We don't now have 10,000 gods. We have 10,000 and one gods. And just add the name inside this big, thick book. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Why can't he just do that? So the rabbi says something very, very important. And this is a key lesson we need to understand. And it is... Lahavdil, to make a very big and important difference between what Moshe Rabbeinu was telling him about the true God of Israel and the entire world and all the other small G gods, not the OG, as I like to call them, right? But the small G. And what's the difference? The difference is that all of these gods that were operating in Egypt in Mitzrayim were gods that they were scared of. They were scared of they needed the Nile, scared that it would overflow, we wouldn't have enough water, and so they worshipped it. They were scared of a lack of fish, so they worshipped it. You name it, they worshipped it. And there was also sacrifice as well, they sacrificed people. It was all out of fear, out of Yira. Moshe Rabbeinu was introducing into Mitzrayim something which never existed. Not just a different god, Lahavdil, but a whole new concept, which is the god of love the god of Ahava. This was a new concept that Paro couldn't even relate to, and therefore he couldn't add it to this book of gods. What is this idea, this god that Vaera speaks about, that even the Avot didn't operate with, the Avot operate with Kel Shakai, that was the attribute of Hashem they operated with, the non-miraculous, uh, open version of God. The attribute of God that they were operating with now, says Hashem, is go in and tell him, I'm here, yud, hey, with a vav and a hey. That is three names of God. Haya, was, hove, is, yeah, will be. That is God who is past, present, and future. This is the God that is beyond time. The miraculous God. The God is not as trapped into one period of history like these gods of Mitzrayim. This is the God of love. How do you show someone you love them? You help them. You assist them. 
And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying. This is the God of love. And this God of love that we're talking about is going to rescue the Jewish people from your hand. And it's going to let them out. Now we can do this the easy way or we can do this the difficult way. That's your choice. And at first, Paro said no because he wanted to. And then Hashem hardened his heart for the last five plagues to make sure that everybody understood that the Jewish people were leaving Mitzrayim and going to receive the Torah 50 days later. So that is the new, that's what the Ramban says. This is a new concept of God that Mitzrayim was not aware of. Now, of course, the Avot, the forefathers and the foremothers were aware of this. And Yosef was aware of this. And the Shvatim were aware of this. But this idea was not present in the world. But at this point, and from this point onwards, it was always going to be present. And so the Makot, the plagues, became the vehicle by which HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God, was going to instruct and inform the world of this new idea. And actually the Makot, although there's ten of them, which actually correspond to the Ten Commandments, which are going to be given 50 days after leaving Mitzrayim. So we have ten makot corresponding to ten commandments, which also correspond to the ten statements that were made in creation of the world. Ten times the word vayomer is mentioned in creation, and it corresponds to those ten. So it's ten for ten for ten. That's what we're looking at over here. Let's just have a look at these makot, because the makot are actually divided up into th four groupings, three, 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 and one. And each one of these groupings come to teach us something else. Well, the first makah, of course, is the dam, is the blood. Blood is the first plague that came upon Mitzrayim. Interestingly, we know that Moshe Rabbeinu was not the one who initiated this particular makah. Why? Because the Nile, the Nilus, had to turn to blood. And Moshe Rabbeinu was saved by the Nile. And therefore, it would have been a lack of gratitude to the Nile that saved him when he was a baby. And he was put by his sister Miriam into a little basket, into up, into Teva, and sent out into the Nile. And therefore, my dear friends, he was not permitted or he decided not to put the entire Nal into a state of dam, into a state of blood. Unusual. And by the way, it's also the same with the Sephardea, with the frogs, and the Kinim. He was not involved in them, because they involved the Nile and the dust of the earth. And Moshe Rabbeinu had to show gratitude to the dust of the earth. Really? Why would Moshe... Moses had to give gratitude to the dust of the earth because the dust of the earth saved him as well. When was that? When he killed the Mitzri. He used the special name of Hashem, the Shem HaMeforash, the special name of God, that he was able to kill this Mitzri who was attacking a Jewish man who was about to kill him. And he buried him in the Chol, in the dust of the earth. He says, oh, the dust of the earth. It saved me because it... It buried this Mitzri that was about to kill the Jew. And therefore, I can't kill. What is this idea, as a side point, that we see Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't do these first few plagues because he couldn't hurt the Nile? And he could. Does the Nile care? Does the Nile really care if you turn to blood? Does the dust of the earth care if you bring out Kinim from it, lice from it? What was the big deal? These are not, are not animate objects, they're inanimate. So the rabbis tell us something very important. And we actually do something to this day which represents this concept too. We take the feelings of inanimate objects into our consciousness. Why? It's not that they have any form of um, need for gratitude. They're inanimate. They're water. They're dust. They're dirt. What's the big deal? And the answer is that we should be sensitive even to inanimate objects. If you're sensitive to inanimate object, then, say the rabbis, you will become sensitive to animate objects and then eventually to other humans. For example, we know that we make kiddush on Friday night and we cover over the challah. Why do we cover over the challah when we make kiddush? Because really you should make hamotzi first. That's what you're meant to do. However, you can't make 
Hamotzi first, because you need to be Makadesh at Yom. You have to make Kiddush. And so what do we do? We don't want to embarrass the Chala by making it go second, because really it should go first. But it can't go first, because we have to make Kiddush on the wine first instead. So the Hamotzi goes second. So we cover over the Chala. We cover it over so it shouldn't see that we're making Kiddush on the wine. That's what we do. That's what we cover over. That's one of the reasons we cover over the chala. Another reason is because it represents the man that was covered over on top and below. It came in a kufsa. It came in a box. But the embarrassment answer needs an explanation. And it's this concept as well, my dear friends. The concept is that we don't embarrass the chala. But chala does not get embarrassed. I know. And the na doesn't get embarrassed either or need recognition. And the dust of the earth in Egypt didn't need it either. But if you show Rachmanut towards inanimate objects and you treat things with respect, eventually you get into a training and you start to treat people with respect as well. That's what the rabbis tell us. And therefore, precious objects need to be treated well and respectfully. And respectfully as well. By the way, it is a fine line, but, but you should know something. On this exact point, Rabbi Kaplan speaks about this. They did worship these things. They used to worship the dust. That's why Avram Avin used to make sure they would wipe the dust off their feet. They used to worship. They used to worship everything. Having said that, they weren't crazy. When they worshipped a tree, when they worshipped a leaf, when they worshipped the Nile, don't think, oh, they're completely majnun, they're completely divonair, they're crazy people. You shouldn't think that. They saw something in the Nile. They saw something in the, um, in the tree, in the leaf, in a person that was of divine attribute, divine essence, divine origin. They weren't crazy. They don't think, oh, they're so stupid, these people. They weren't stupid at all. They were very, very smart. They saw something in that leaf that we don't see nowadays, and they connected to it on a very deep and spiritual level. Let's talk about frogs. Because frog, Sephardea, was, of course, one of the early makot. And we learned something very, very interesting about the Mitzrayim from these frogs. Because it uses a singular to describe the frogs. Yep. It says Sephardea. However, we know there were many, many frogs. Actually, the Sephorno says they weren't frogs. They were crocodiles or alligators, which makes the entire plague very, very different, right? Frogs is one thing. You're dealing with like snapping toothy objects and creatures, it becomes a lot scarier. Okay, so out come these frogs and they were all over the place. But the origin of these frogs, and Rashi mentions this, comes from Midrash, was one frog. It's a farday, it says. One opinion. Another opinion is you can say multiple frogs also a singular, like one fish, two fish. But another answer is no. Actually, there was one frog. And this one frog eventually became myriads, thousands, and then hundreds of thousands of frogs, or alligators and crocodiles. How? They would hit it. Every time they would hit the frog, it became two. And they would hit it again, and two became four. And they would hit it again, and that would multiply. So what started off as one sephardea, one frog, became two, became four, became eight, and it became multiples. Why? Why do they do this? At what point should they have realized that hitting this frog in order to destroy it was not going to work? It was just worsening their situation. Every time they hit it, it multiplied, it doubled. Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. It kept multiplying. What happened over here? I mean, I hear. You see this big frog coming at you, it's alligator, you hit it once, it multiplies. Okay, I'll try again. But at some point, when you start reaching the hundreds and thousands, Shouldn't it be like, this is not working? We've got to find another way to get rid of these frogs. Why do they keep going till there were hundreds of thousands of them? And the rabbis say something fascinating. They say that they were suffering from a problem in Mitzrayim. And what was this problem? Anger. They were not working on their midot. And when you suffer, says the Sefer Hasidim, when you suffer, and the Orchat Sadiqim rather, when you suffer from this midah of kas, of anger, all forms of gehenom, sholitba, 
all forms of hell are going to control you to such a degree that even something which seems so obvious, something that seems so simple, is now beyond your intelligence. Even knowing that you should stop hitting frogs because it's getting worse and worse and worse, you don't care. You just don't care because I'm now out of control. And therefore, we know that they had anger problems in Mitzrayim and they couldn't stop hitting these frogs, although it was killing and destroying them. Therefore, Egypt wasn't destroyed from the outside. It was destroyed from the inside. And by the way, many great nation states, they say, weren't destroyed from the outside, like Rome or Greece, but actually they were destroyed by their own bad traits that were inside these nations. And we see that this trait of cast of anger, of not being able to control your emotions, is actually one of the greatest destroyers of nation states. I'm going to add to anger, by the way, kavod, honor, because anger and kavod, as the Rambam, go together. Every time a person gets angry, it's really their honor that is pushing them to get angry, right? Like you, I don't know, you go to the parking lot and you're giving your ticket and then a person comes a minute later, gives their ticket and they get their car first and you get angry. Why? You don't think to yourself, well, maybe their car was in a better position than me, right? You're like, hey, who is this person? I was here first. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? So every time a person gets angry, says the Rambam, there's an element of kavod, of honor, that is injected into it. And therefore, the Mitzrayim was suffering from a disease. It was an anger disease. But actually, really, it was a kavod disease. They were dealing with kavod issues. They thought they were better than they really were. And therefore, the seeds of their destruction did not come from the makot. The makot, the plagues came. But really, they created their own demise because they didn't know how to relate to the challenges that are coming to them. This society of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, actually ate itself from the inside, from the kishkas. And that is what the rabbis tell us. And actually we know, the Gemara tells us, that there's three ways to figure out a person. There's three ways to figure out the character of a person. Kis, kos, kas. Kiso, koso, kaso. What are these three things, kiss, kos, kas? Kiss is pocket, money. You can figure out a person by how they spend their money or how they waste their money. If you want to figure out, I speak to people who are uh, dating, you know, and they say, how can I figure out the p- character of the person? I'm like, what do they do with their money? How do they treat their money? What's important? Where do they invest their money? How much tzedakah do they give or do not give? You can figure out a lot about a person by their relationship to their kiss, their money. Are they giving? Are they generous? Are they investing in things that are ethical and moral? All of these things demonstrate to us very, very much what a person is about. So that is kiss. Next is kos. Kos is drink. You can figure out a person's personality by what they're like when they are drunk. When you've drunk too much, you can figure out a person's personality. Some people drink too much and they become depressed and start crying. And some of them drink and they become all happy and very, very joyful. So the Gemara says you can figure out a person by what they're like when they're drunk. So someone said to me, well, I'm dating a guy and he doesn't drink on the dates. So how can I figure out his personality or her personality from when they are uh, drinking? So I said, it's very simple, just date them over Purim. Date them over Purim, because when they act on Purim, that's their essence. Nichna sayayin, the wine goes out, yotza sod, out comes the secrets. Well, if they drank too much, a lot more comes out. But that's how you figure out a person, by their drink. How much they drink, how they act when they are drunk. Right? And too much drinking, obviously, is going to be a, a, a very important indicator as well. And finally, kaso. What is a person like when they get angry? What makes them angry? How do they act? Are they quick to anger? Are they slow to anger? As the Mishnah, actually maybe a Braita, at the end of Pirka Avot tells us, because the sixth chapter of Pirka Avot is actually Braitot, tells us you can figure out a person's personality 
by their reaction and their speed to get angry. The Mishnah says there's actually four types of people in the world. The entire world can be divided up into four groups. People are quick to anger, but quick to slow down. People are slow to anger, but slow to calm down. People are quick to anger, slow to calm down. Slow to anger, but quick to calm down. Those are your four groupings. Everyone falls into one of those four midot, says the Mishnah in Pirkavot. By the way, which is the worst of them? People who are quick to anger, but slow to calm down. Very, very quick to get them angry, but slow to calm down. That, says the Mishnah, is a rasha. It's a bad one. What's the best of the four? Someone who's very slow to anger. It takes a long time for them to get angry, but very quick to calm down. They get over things very, very quickly. That's the best. That is actually called them, if I remember correctly, the Mishnah calls them a chassid, a righteous chassid. That doesn't mean a, you know, a strimal-wearing individual. That's a person who takes their connection to Hashem in a very, very serious way. The rabbis ask, why is there no fifth category? Why is there no category of someone who doesn't get angry? And the answer is, there is no such category. Everyone is dealing with kas. And by the way, Paro, Moshe Rabbeinu lived in Paro's palace. Moshe Rabbeinu says a midrash, which I know some people do not like. I find it very, very relieving. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu also had a natural netia, a natural pull towards kas, towards anger. Really? Like, really, is that possible? There's an unbelievable midrash about this which is brought down by the Chachamim, by the rabbis. And it says that Paro wanted to figure out Moshe Rabbeinu's personality. And so he did the following. He wanted to know who this savior of the Jewish people is, assuming that it was a new Paro, not the one who was in the palace beforehand, but the Melech Chadash, and Chadash Mamash, an absolute new king. And so he sent people to draw the face of Moshe Rabbeinu. And they went, and they drew his face, and he brought back this these portraits of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he had certain experts who had something called Chochmata Paritzuf, Wisdom of the Face, actually a chapter in the Zohar, which I saw, which actually has the secrets of how to read a person's face. Some people have it instinctively. You look at a person's face, you're like, that's not a good person. You look at a person's face, you're like, that's a good person. Why? Because the face, the panim, reveals the panim. The face reveals the panim, the inside. You can figure out a person by looking at their face. And so Paro had experts who were able to look at the face of Moshe Rabbeinu and figure out what it was like. And so they looked at these portraits that were drawn to Moshe Rabbeinu and they were like, this cannot be the savior of the Jewish people. This person has various character flaws and defects. This person has anger problems. This person has other... And they listed off certain attributes which should not have made Moshe Rabbeinu a leader of the Jewish people. This is a problem. Many years later, or maybe a little later, Moshe Rabbeinu and Paro met up. And Paro said, it cannot be that you are the savior of the Jewish people. It's going to take the Jewish people out. You cannot be a leader because you have these negative attributes. And he says, you know what? It's true. I have but I work on them. And my cuss, my anger, which probably was taken in by living in Mitzrayim and in the palace of Paro and having Kavod over there as well, affected him. But Moshe Rabbeinu was willing and able to overcome these negative attributes. So maybe he was born with them. Maybe they were nurture. Maybe he inherited them from the people around him. Maybe it was nurture. But the Midrash says he was able to overcome them no matter how bad your negative traits are, to become the leader of the Jewish people. And sometimes, even the Rambam says, they flared up a little bit. We know that eventually later on, he's going to hit the cellar, the rock. And one opinion is, why did he hit the rock? Because he lost his temper. And because of that, unfortunately, there was one reason he was not able to lead the Bnei Israel into Israel, into the land itself. Because he lost his temper just that once. He just came through that one time. We know that great people are held to a much 
higher standard. Sa'ra, a much higher standard, and therefore he was not allowed in because of it. And so the whole downfall of Mitzrayim may not have actually been the makot. The makot, the plagues, actually brought out the negative traits that were there. And therefore Mitzrayim could have actually not been destroyed and could have let the Jewish people go and everything would have been fantastic. They could have carried on as they were and we could have gone and we could have gone straight to Har Sinai and everything would have been great. Gewaldic. No. No. Their negative attributes, in this case, kavod, honor, and ka'as and anger ended up becoming the ultimate self-destruction that led to the downfall of Mitzrayim and led to the downfall of Paro and eventually allowed the Bnei Israel to leave in order to become free people from Avdut Lechirut in order to receive the Torah. And so too, we don't have time to go through all the plagues today, every one of the Makot wasn't just like a smack that Mitzrayim, it was that as well. It was also a lesson to the Mitzrayim and a lesson to everyone else because everybody knew the Makkah were happening and it was printed in the Torah in great detail. Everyone knew how each one of the Makkot actually revealed some defect, some major character flaw inside Mitzrayim. And that is what led to their downfall. And so how do we keep a nation, state, whole and complete and successful? Every nation needs not always to look outside to see threats from outside. They need to see what is the inner threat. What are we doing to each other that is not allowing us to survive? I'll finish with a quick midrash about Shlomo HaMelech. When Shlomo HaMelech was very, very young, when he became king of the Jewish people, right? Was he, Solomon was 12, maybe 30, very, very young, young man. And the Midrash says that he went around the world because he wanted to see and learn from other kings. So he went to some place in Afriki, wanted to show some in Africa, and he saw there was a small nation state. And so he went there to talk to this king who was in this nation state. And he walked over this king, and he said, I want to watch you judge your people. He said, no problem. You can stick around and you can learn from me. Two guys came in and they were arguing, says the Midrash, over a plot of land. This one says it belongs to me. And this one said, no, it belongs to me. Right? It's like Baba Metziah. Right? This one says it belongs to me. This one. And they came to this king and Shlomo Melech is watching this scene. And they said, this land belongs to me. This land belongs to me. And the king says, ah, oh. Actually, it belongs to me. He killed both of them, and he took it for himself. And Shlomo Melech said, What the heck was that? <laughs> what are you doing? So he says, Aren't you impressed by how I run my country? And Shlomo's like, I don't understand. How do you do that? He said, This is the way we run things in my country. And Shlomo Melech said to him something, something amazing. He said, Tell me, do you have any animals in your land? And the king is like, of course we have animals. We have sheep. We have cows. And he says, uh, does it rain in your land? He says, yeah, once in a while. I mean, it's a pretty sunny place, but we get rain. And he says, let me tell you something. The merit of the rain that sustains your country comes in the merit of the animals. Because the way your legal system works does not entitle you to have the merit of rain. You as a nation are going to fall because the only merit that you have is that God wants to sustain your animals. But really, you should not be here because every nation state is judged according to how they treat others and the legal system that they set in place, which is actually one of the seven Noahide laws, right? The Shiva Mitzvah B'nai Noach is that you need to have a fair and just legal system. And you do not have that. And therefore your nation state is going to be destroyed. The fact that it's even here right now is for one reason and one reason only. Because you have animals. And God doesn't want to see your animals destroyed. And therefore he brings rain down, which you can drink, but it's in their merit. That's not the way you treat people. Mitzrayim was the same. Mitzrayim treated its people 
and its slaves, and we saw the Jewish people horrendously. That, that, my friends, was the downfall of Mitzrayim. The way they treated each other, not just the Jewish people. We had it bad, but there were many other people. In Egypt, Mitzrayim had it bad too. And the um, evil character traits that were inside Mitzrayim, how they uh, treated each other, ended up becoming their downfall. And so we learn that the way to keep our nation state, the Bnei Israel and Am Yisrael safe, isn't so much, weirdly enough, how we treat in our relationship to Hashem. It's actually how we treat in our relationship to each other. Have a great and wonderful day. Slacha Rabbah. Azlev Yamatz.